Welcome everybody. While we're waiting that all of us um, are joining this session, um, we will be explaining a little bit of background of what we're going to be doing uh, today. So while we are joining a little bit of information of what is coming um, uh, soon in the society. So as you know, very recent, well, in like a couple of weeks, we have a virtual workshop series called Spatial Phylogenetics, organized by Matthew Kling, Kyle Rosenblatt, and Israel Borokini. Uh, if you're interested in this information, there's a lot of, um, in this workshop, there is a lot of information on the website. And then as well, let's remember that we will have in 2024, our next biennial conference in Prague. So as well, we will be posting a lot of news and information in the, in the website. And just a reminder, um, questions and answers. We will have time for questions uh, for Andres uh, at the end of uh, his talk. And this is just a reminder. Remember that you will have on the bottom of your slide, these icons here, like uh, the chat, you can raise your hand and make your, uh, basically make your question um, loud, let's say, and then we will be answering as well questions and answers uh, typed in. So a lot of different, a lot of different ways of communicating and, and putting your questions out there for Andres to be able to answer. Let's just wait a couple of minutes more. Okay, I see that numbers of people attending are constant now, so let's start. Um, first of all, welcome Andres, but um, and all welcome to the next session of the Funk uh, Lecture Theories. Uh, basically, let's just remember when all this started. Uh, this uh, series are honoring Vicky Funk that was a founding member of the International Biogeography Society, as well as she was a past IBS president. And the Fong lectures started um, with a special spirit of connecting biogeographers around the world, but as well to increase the awareness of the contributions and findings of this amazing discipline. And we have here today, and it is uh, great having you here, Andres, uh, Dr. Andres um, Lira Noriega, uh, welcome. And uh, just briefly, I will introduce him. He um, has a degree in biology and a master's in biology from the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, and as well a PhD at the University of Kansas. And Andres' research focuses on analysis of species distribution and ecological niche and multiple spatial scales uh, and temporal as well scales. Basically, he kind of combines extensive use of databases from both scientific collections, but as well laboratory observations, and he combined this with um, ecological niche modeling, and more recently with an artificial intelligence tool, as a talk he will be delivering today, where he starts a new, uh, a new interest for him that is linking and predicting infection disease in wildlife using artificial intelligence tool. So, Andres, all for you, and thank you for being here. Great, thanks, Sandra. Uh, well, hi everyone. Uh, you see my screen, right? All is good. Looks good. Okay. Well, thank you, Sandra, for that kind introduction. And thank you all for being here, given we're all in different time zones. A special thanks to Pilar uh, Rodriguez and the uh, other members of the Committee of the International Biography Society who have invited me to give this talk. Like Sandra said, this is new in, in my research area of, of, of expertise. This is kind of a new topic to me. 
So I'm going to try uh, to do my best delivering this message on what we're doing right now. What I want to do today is to give a general overview of the global trends uh, of emerging and human infectious diseases, how they, they look in general, and then talk about what we recently, recently published in the uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences Journal, which is a new framework uh, based on machine learning to uh, uh, predict uh, susceptible species at global scales. And then talk about uh, some discussion, conclusions, and future perspectives on, on that same idea. So uh, basically, central topic is that emergence of infectious uh, diseases in humans and wildlife is uh, continuous, and it's a natural process, and it has rapidly intensified globally. That's something that has been happening around the world. And this diversity and frequency of infections outbreaks uh, has increased over time. No? And that speaks a lot about the interface human wildlife. What you see in the screen, uh, it's um, two colleagues, uh, Brazil, Mexico, uh, Roberta and Daniel that are collecting uh, roadkill uh, mammals around Brazil last year. And this is what it's supposed to be a reservoir of lepra. No? They uh, traveled for uh, around 42,000 kilometers around Brazil during one year, uh, trying to search for um, potential uh, uh, reservoirs of different diseases, collecting the tissues of these animals and taking advantage of sadly roadkill animals. So this is something that has uh, brought, brought big interest worldwide. And this is an example of what people is doing to collect more information about these outbreaks. It's not new to us worldwide and any of you what has recently happened, no? This is um, atom, atom uh, ultrastructure of the, of the uh, virus that recently caused the pandemic, the coronavirus uh, that uh, spilled uh, over uh, from animals to humans and um, causing the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so, um, we know that uh, since uh, uh, December uh, 2019, there was uh, an, 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 alert, an alert, and then uh, it was declared by the World uh, Health Organization as a pandemic problem in January 2020. So what this type of events cause is a lot of uncertainty on when and where can the outbreak of uh, this type of events happen again. No? So, this is great concern. This uh, pandemic has caused more than six and a half million globally. This is a, uh, you know, an estimate that is comes from official sources, but we know the number can be much more, given that many of these cases have not been recorded. And so, uh, how has this been looking uh, through time? So I've been using, uh, I'll use different papers that I collected from scientific literature to show the trend on uh, emerging infectious diseases, and uh, then jump into the framework we're proposing to predict these type of events. So what you see in, this, uh, in these plots here on the upper left panel is that there has been an increase on the number of emerging infectious diseases through time, and they belong to different pathogen types, transmission types as well. Many of them come from zoonosis, uh, and some are related to different types of drug resistance and different transmission modes. No? Some are vector-borne, some are non-vector-borne diseases. Spatially, the pattern uh, looks like the maps you look on the, on the bottom of this slide. And so there are sonotic pathogens from wildlife on the upper left panel here, the panel A. And you can see the uh, tropical areas are uh, really important. No? Some Africa regions, uh, the Asian, etc. There are also prevalence of vector-borne pathogens, as you can see in, in the panel D on the bottom right. No? So these uh, events are dominated by zoonosis, and they orgi originate in wildlife and are uh, mainly related to changes or correlated with the socioeconomical and environmental changes, different ecological factors that uh, most of them are probably in the interface of human wildlife and these drastic changes we have observed 
globally. This other a paper by Smith and colleagues in 2014 shows similar patterns, as you can see in the upper left panel, an increase through time. But what I want you to look at is to this uh, bottom right uh, set of uh, maps that what are telling us is that there has been an increase in uh, the number of outbreaks related to human uh, infectious diseases globally per country. And that's something that has been a uh, increasing through time, no? Most of these related to bacteria and viruses and of not animal origin. In this other publication by Gibb and colleagues, what they tell us is that the amount uh, of, or the abundance of different uh, primary, uh, the difference between primary uh, host and non-host, I, I mean, um, diseases, um, um, uh, hosts related to these diseases uh, are more prevalent in, in agricultural and urban uh, habitats compared to undisturbed habitats. And this is perhaps more uh, observed in the case of passeriformes, birds, chiroptera, bats, and rodents compared to other uh, taxa. So it's important to understand then that um, alteration to natural habitats can uh, be related to the presence of sonotic hosts and their diversity. So there have been other efforts that tell us uh, which variables can be related to these uh, uh, diseases, not the emergence of these diseases. And uh, as you can see in this panel on the left, some are human activity related, some are animal related, or some are environmental related. But the overall conclusion is that even though we know this influence, these sonotic events, uh, it's not strictly that some of them or, or, or which of them are always going to cause these diseases. It's more like a general pattern that we observe uh, in relation to these variables or type of variables that may be related to these sonotic events. And what you can see on the upper and bottom right panel is the general distribution of where we expect these events to, to occur. And it's mainly across tropical regions worldwide. So in relation to the drivers of these zoonotic infectious diseases, we can see that they are strongly uh, related to this human wildlife interface in general uh, related to changes in agricultural and uh, other food production practices and wildlife hunting. No? So uh, that's like the general trend and main drivers that we see that may be causing these uh, emerging infectious diseases worldwide. So what have we done in order to try to predict potential hosts that may be uh, reservoirs of these pathogens that are of interest? So we uh, form a team of colleagues here, there is an, an Angel who is a physicist and then has lots of interest in biology. And Diego, who is a wildlife parasitologist, ecologist and an evolutionary biologist. And so we got together and started working on first with Angel on combining phylogenetic and occurrence information to uh, working with uh, phytopathogenic uh, cases. Uh, and then with Diego, we started incorporated other type of diseases, more from the wildlife, and that's what we have been working on recently. So what we try to, to do with this framework is to have a machine learning approach that can help us to estimate the probability of susceptibility of potential hosts uh, based on their similarity regarding different independent variables. We are proposing three but it can be any other set of variables. So for example, we're using geographic, environmental, and phylogenetic distances as really important predictors of biogeographic uh, patterns of diversity, but it may be important to incorporate other variables if you may want. So this machine uh, learning approach can be applied to any multi-host, multi-pathogen system. And the idea is to identify potential hosts uh, species where the pathogen has not been previously detected or has not been considered in the field for different 
projects or purposes, or is not necessarily the host species with the highest incidence. We have published this framework already in this paper that appeared in 2021 in Frontiers in Veterinary Science, and more recently, uh, this other paper in PNAS. No? That's where we are proposing this framework. Uh, the workflow of the framework is the following. You have mainly six steps. The first one is to collect information on the hosts and the different uh, independent variables you want to use to predict these uh, uh, susceptible species. Uh, you need to then look for pathogen incidence data. No? Ideally, that is tested in the laboratory to be really sure that this is a true presence of a pathogen of interest. And then there is a set of steps in panel C and D where we tune up the machine learning. No? It's uh, uh, basically uh, uh, running different trials using what we call the known and unknown hosts. Known when we uh, set aside the top incidences that we know for sure will be useful to predict the, uh, the susceptible species. And the unknown are either species that we don't know anything about their potential as reservoirs or that have very low incidence. Those may play as unknown species. And then once you run all these steps related to the machine learning and fine tuning of it, you can then uh, estimate the susceptibility and then uh, look at it in different environments or dimensions of biodiversity, which is either bio, 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 geography or environment, you know, looking at their ecological niches or environmental space or the phylogeny in this case. Uh, the independent variables, as I mentioned before, uh, that we're using for this approach right now is geographic, environmental, and phylogenetic distances. Basically for the geographic distance, we took the range uh, polygons from the IUCN and uh, measured the distance from the centroid of the largest polygon to the rest of the different species we are using. So let's, we're, let's say we're collecting all the distributions of all the mammals, we're extracting that centroid and then measuring as a surrogate of geographic distance among, among mammal species. Then for environmental distance, we do something similar, except that we're using environmental dimensions related to the three first principal components of the world clean 19 bioclimatic variables. And extracting the centroid using an ellipsoid approach and uh, then measuring same, same ones, no? from the centroid of one species to the rest of the other species, candidate species that form the pool of species within that uh, analysis. And finally, for the phylogenetic distance, we are using different phylogenies. For example, for birds, we're using this published by Jets and colleagues, a global phylogeny of birds. And for mammals, we're using this uh, more recent uh, phylogeny from Upham, uh, published in, in PLOS one and measuring the phylogenetic distance between hosts. Why do we use environmental distance uh, as, we, as we did? Well, it's been um, since a few years back, uh, interesting to understand that the uh, ecological niche centrality hypothesis can be useful to understand which is the optimal uh, environmental combination for each species where you would expect a uh, higher abundances or higher genetic diversity or all the other ecological processes such as phenology and physiology. So the centroid is a good proxy of this optimal uh, environmental set of variables that allow the species to uh, have better fitness and other processes. That's why we're using that measure. Geographic distance is just, as I mentioned, a general uh, distance between species to have uh, a, a, a proxy of proximity in geographic space. Regarding phylogenetic distance, uh, well, it's been, uh, you know, it's uh, been, um, you know, different publications are there that tells that it's important to use phylogenetic distance to predict uh, the susceptibility of hosts to share different pathogens. The way I got inspired was by uh, looking at a seminar from Greg Gilbert from UC Santa Cruz. And uh, in this publication that I'm putting here is where uh, he has 
with other colleagues showed very clearly in, in case of different uh, pathogens that affect plants, that the closer you are phylogenetically speaking, in terms of a plant species, the higher the probability of sharing pests. So that's why I got excited about this idea of using phylogenetic distance and try to incorporate other measures uh, like uh, environmental or geographic distance as part of the same framework. So what we did in this um, to test this framework was to use three uh, case uh, studies uh, to our vector borne, which are the avian malaria and the West Nile virus, and one is of direct transmission, which is the coronavirus and bats. So avian malaria is a parasite from the genus Plasmodium. No, it infects more than 300 bird species worldwide. It's known to cause extinction of many endemic birds in Hawaii, for example. It infects a phylogenetically close a hosts. So that's something that we should keep, keep in mind. And we also know that temperature and precipitation may be good predictors. For this case, we're using the database of Malawi and we filter for bird associations with a plasmodium relictum, no? different strains. In the case of West Nile virus, uh, we're looking at the Flaviviridae family transmitted by this mosquito of the genus Ulex. It affects uh, birds uh, and these bird species of different orders are reservoirs of this uh, uh, virus. Uh, human and non-human mammals may be incidental terminal hosts like Eruptura carnivora, Artiodactyla, Rodentia. And it's known to be limited by land and climatic conditions uh, as well. In terms of the coronavirus and bats, we know that a small fraction of the coronaviruses uh, can cause uh, zoonosis on humans like SARS-CoV-2, MERS. Uh, there is a high correlation of coronavirus diversity and bat diversity. And it's a problem, a bit, little bit more problematic because of the ecology of bats Sometimes uh, these coronavirus switch hosts, which make it difficult to discover intermediate reservoirs and which are the community connectors. Um, its distribution and host range appear to be more influenced by ecological and phylogenetic factors. And uh, also there is a strong correlation with uh, sympatric rodents. For this, um, the case we're using the, the um, uh, um, that based on bat associated viruses, the bat ver, and for the information on incidences for West Nile virus, we're using this information published by Tolsa and colleagues in 2018, and using serological and molecular prevalence data. No? So those are the, the set. That's a set of information we're using as incidents uh, for these three uh, study systems. So which Incidence data should we use? And this is something that we discover is key in the, in the, in the whole protocol. If by incidence, we mean a host species infected or exposed, and in terms of being positive by an immune reaction to the pathogen. So ideally that we have that tested. And we're talking about presence only data. We're not using abundance or other kind of information except only presence only data. And something we discovered by applying the power law distribution testing for it uh, is that a small proportion of the hosts with uh, incidence information contain 80 80, close to 80% of the incidence information. And that, that amount of host data, no, between 20 and 40% of the host species that contain the largest amount of incidence data can be enough to get robust results. So that's something really important because sometimes we don't know which species to use to calibrate these models. So as you can see in this left panel in the, in the birds plus modern relictum, I'm showing you different um, areas of the, of the relationship the, of the power law distribution. In black dots, you have the cases with lower incidence. Those, are, those dots are species of hosts. Then you have the region of higher incidence, and then you have this inflection point. And this, uh, Power law distribution allows us to um, select the top uh, incidence cases that we will use eventually to calibrate the models. It is interesting that the three antagonistic systems approximate a power law, and that's something that has been observed previously by uh, colleagues working with mutualistic interactions, uh, Jordan and colleagues in 2003. 
Uh, so, three, so this is important and can have, uh, you know, implications in other fields of research, in, in, in this case, uh, interaction networks. So again, uh, which incidence data should we use? And I'm showing you here two plots. On the left, all the bird species, and in the case of uh, malarian birds, and on the right, the, only the tip, top 10 bird species with highest incidence. And what you see is that uh, if we don't select the top incidence cases, it is more difficult for the algorithm to distinguish the uh, unknown cases from the known cases, no? The incidence versus the known incidence cases. Instead, if you only take the top 10 uh, or some proportion of the higher incidence cases, the algorithm would do a better job at distinguishing between uh, or among those incidences and the prediction would be probably easier for this machine learning approach. Then uh, the following step was to uh, prepare and, and calibrate and test the algorithm. And I want to say that we tested several algorithms, uh, GAMS, uh, GLMs, logistic regressions, et cetera. And that we found that most of them times uh, the uh, random forest was a good algorithm to work with. That doesn't mean that that has to be the case, but in, in these uh, uh, study systems and for this type of data, they, it worked well. And what we're doing is, as I mentioned before, is to split the data between unknown and unknown cases that we will use then to uh, calibrate the model. So known cases will, will always be uh, giving the signal of the, these independent variables to the system. And we will be uh, running this several times. It's not just one time that we do this split and run of the algorithm. Um, and well, the performance of the model, as I mentioned, was really good for random forests. In terms of results, I want to show uh, really quickly what, what we saw. And I'm showing you the susceptibility pattern in, in geographic space and summarize as uh, species richness of those species that uh, we suggest are susceptible after all this protocol. And as you can see, the patterns change for each of these systems, bird, birds and malaria first, birds and West Nile virus, and bats and coronaviruses at the bottom. The, also the um, importance of the predictor variables changes with the system. That's probably one of the most important results uh, so to speak, it's not always that the same variable is the best predictor, but the predictors change according to the system. And that's something really relevant. It's not new, but it's something really important because it allows us to think about which uh, variables may be more uh, important or influencing this uh, uh, susceptibility. So for the birds and malaria case, we saw on geographic space, that higher susceptibility areas, you know, summarized by larger uh, geographic realms, are the Palearctic, then the Afrotropical and Indo-Malayan regions. We detected or saw that undersampled regions uh, can be the south of Russia, east of Kazakhstan, and northwest Mongolia. And we infer that genetic structure is playing a, an important role here and uh, influencing the evolutionary history of these uh, by geographic of what's going on in these biogeographic regions. For, the, for this system, no, birds and malaria, environmental distance was really important and then followed by the interaction of geographic and phylogenetic distance and then geographic and environment. But important to see that environment plays a very uh, high importance. For the birds and West Nile virus, we saw that higher susceptibilities across the Palearctic and North American regions, followed by the Indo-Malayan regions. Under sample regions may be Russia, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, India, Northwest uh, North America, and Southeast Asia. And most important variables are phylogenetic distance and the interaction of geographic and environmental distance in environment. So uh, the high diversity of tropical regions and the diversity of the immune system of the hosts can or could be uh, could function as dilution factors. So there are there may be different explanations that are happening at different scales, not necessarily at these broad scales 
that can help to explain these patterns, but I'm not going to, to, to go into much detail regarding that. Finally, for the bats and the coronaviruses, we can see the high richness is accumulated of susceptible species is accumulated in the Indo-Malayan and Afrotropical than Western Europe regions. And uh, we know that the ecology of bats, you know, how, they, how they move, uh, their abundances, uh, contact between species and individuals uh, can play an important role. And the strong correlation with rodents can also be relevant in terms of finding reservoirs. That's something that has been published elsewhere, and we're just uh, suggesting it as a relevant uh, ecological uh, variable here. Which variable was more important in for, from our results? Geographic distance. And so we know that these other ecological factors may be really relevant. However, from the independent variables, we understand that geographic distance and not other factors are key uh, in finding susceptible bat species for coronaviruses. Then we tested the spatial pattern using a, a intensity point, uh, point, point pattern analysis. No? And so this is what we're looking at in these maps in the middle of the slide, the point intensity pattern using independent points that we never use for calibrating the models. And so that's something really important and difficult to get independent uh, data to test the models. So we use what we found. And in each case, we saw that the pattern that we predicted as susceptibility in terms of accumulating number of species susceptible was uh, not a random uh, process. And that's important to say. Regarding the importance of the predictor variables, as I mentioned before, uh, it, it was really important to see that this is, uh, first of all, uh, the model is complex. Uh, it's not a linear function and uh, the interaction between variables is important, no? So it's not only individual variables or a single variable that we may use as a, the best predictor, but a combination of them what you see in these partial dependent plots for each case uh, is in, in black, each individual run no, of these uh, random forests and the summary or global uh, interpretation using the red uh, line for all those models. And so, um, well, that's, that's something key in, in our results. Not a single viral place most of the, has most of the, of the relevance and the interaction of the variables is important. Regarding susceptible species uh, from, so this is something key in, in our result. And then we, we start suggesting, okay, which species would be important to obtain uh, more samples from, no? or which species have the greatest risk or potential for transmitting uh, these pathogens, uh, or how, what, what role do they play in an interaction network? Uh, that's what we think these results can be used for. And something that was really important to see in each of these tables that summarize the, the results, you see for the three cases, avian malaria, West Nile virus in the middle, and coronaviruses in, on the right, the, the top panel of these tables shows the incidence data and the resulting susceptibility uh, from our modeling. No? And in the bottom of each table, you see uh, the higher susceptibility, susceptible species, or so species with high susceptibility. And it's interesting to notice that not always the species with higher incidence of these pathogens has uh, the highest susceptibility. A very easy case to, to, to show was uh, Passer domesticus in the case of avian malaria which has one of the highest uh, incidence, but around these passer domesticos, which is not the one we predicted with the highest susceptibility, there are many other species of birds that didn't have incidence data and that appear to be susceptible. So what we infer from these results is which other species may be key to think about, no? as I mentioned before, and to start uh, probably playing with in other uh, contexts, either ecology or public health or other 
uh, ways to survey for these species. No? This is the main result. You can see here some of these species in terms of bats, Teronotus uh, personatus or Molossus rufus, which were not the, the ones with higher susceptibility, but uh, they still appear to be uh, really high. No? And so in the case, case of birds, there are different examples here. Well, you, I, I already mentioned the passer domesticus, but there are other uh, mainly related to uh, corvidae and other species. Uh, it's important to, to highlight here that these species are not bad. No, they are only, uh, they only appear to be susceptible to these pathogens according to our models. And it would be ideal to then think about what to do next. Maybe go to the field or where to search for new uh, reservoirs regarding these results. Uh, but I want to highlight that it's not that these species should be, uh, you know, uh, eradicated or something like that. Not, not at all. No? It's just this uh, protocol allows us to see which other species may be relevant in this uh, emerging infectious diseases context. We can also look at the results in environmental space. Uh, and for example, I'm showing you for the three cases on the left, a set of plots, which uh, how do the ecological niches in, in an ellipsoidal uh, fashion, uh, how do they look for the top uh, incidence uh, species? And on the right set of panels, the top susceptibility, uh, the top species with top susceptibility. No, the species, as we mentioned, change are not the same always, and we can see that in certain cases, like for example, uh, West Nile virus and the birds that may be susceptible to West Nile virus, can explore or can have very different ecological niches from what we observe uh, in the higher incidence uh, cases. Same thing can happen, for example, in bats, although interestingly, we saw before that environmental distance was probably not the most uh, important predictor, but geographic uh, distance. So uh, that's something to keep in mind. And one of the questions that we start asking after looking at these results in this uh, dimension, environmental space, is to the need to incorporate probably global uh, climate uh, change scenarios to understand what could be the, the different species and ecological niches, how, where, where would they be uh, in terms of susceptibility? We can do the same for mapping the susceptibility as a continuous variable on the phylogeny. And well, this is just to show you what we did. And some fi may find this more, more important or interesting for their uh, analysis uh, or, ex you know, as the, research. Um, I'm not going to, to go much into, into much more detail regarding this dimension, except that it was interesting to be able to see uh, in this space, phylogenetic space, uh, which, which are the most susceptible species. So what, what ha have we done? Uh, well, first of all, let's say, let's talk about the scale of the analysis. We're looking at a coarser resolution at global scale. Uh, this exercise was done thinking in those uh, terms, large scales, using coarse resolution variables. Uh, perhaps we can think that using phylogenetic distance may be uh, moving uh, across different scales, no? Um, but that's something we cannot say so far, no? We, we are sticking to this coarser, larger scale uh, approach. That doesn't mean that we cannot infer things or start thinking about other potential processes behind these patterns. That's something desirable. And we wish these results and approaches, methodological approaches can help us to, to start doing, you know, thinking about other potential explanations and ways of thinking in order to look for uh, pathogens. Another thing is that we uh, are only looking at the susceptible species, uh, but not other processes, no? as I mentioned before. And for example, uh, this is, uh, these are diseases no? that are suspected to, be, to come from bats and uh, that they have passed to animals and they have ended up affecting humans. We are only looking at this um, uh, region or set of species in the middle highlighted by this dotted uh, dark line. That's what we, our algorithm allows us to see. 
However, we can already start thinking how did this happen? And then other explanations uh, should be important and other type of modeling or data should take place uh, to understand these, these uh, ecological epidemi epidemiological processes. So with this, uh, main conclusions are the following. There is huge uncertainty regarding this when and where new outbreaks of emerging infectious diseases could come from or could occur. Uh, but we think, and this is not exclusive to, to me or our team, it's something I've seen in other research efforts, institutions, the right tools and frameworks should allow us to produce forecasts. Uh, then this machine learning approach that we're proposing can generate reliable global spatial susceptibility predictor predictions for different host parasite systems. That's something really nice. We can use multi-host, multi-pathogen systems. Uh, also, an interesting finding was that uh, applying this power law distribution allowed us to select the top incidence cases that were really useful to get uh, reliable models. This approach could also be useful for guiding surveillance field efforts, uh, providing cost-effective decisions and uh, promoting research that we so much need uh, right now uh, in face of different diseases like monkeypox or other uh, potential emerging infectious diseases or, or uh, then this whole framework uh, is supporting this idea that mapping disease transmission risk uh, benefits from incorporating biogeographic and ecological contexts. No? So when public health and epidemiological for, uh, forget about these biogeographic and ecological contexts uh, is something we should uh, try to, to improve and uh, you know, incorporate these dimensions seems to be really relevant for predicting susceptible species. What may be future perspectives? Well, first of all, I think uh, we should incorporate ch uh, changes in land use and climate change. Again, this is something other colleagues around the world have been already doing. Uh, but it's really uh, important given the trends we are looking at in happening in the world. There is a, a, a huge devastation of ecosystems uh, after we saw that this interface, wildlife, human, and uh, that uh, eroded ecosystems, uh, disturbed ecosystems are really key to uh, predict potential outbreaks then we should really be looking and incorporating these variables in our modeling uh, as well. Another interesting uh, thing is to think about what we call the fields of biodiversity and the interactions among species. So more generally, this analysis of geographical coexistence and the phylogenetic or environmental structure of the interactions. And this is something other colleagues have been uh, pro you know, promoting from different fields of research, evolutionary macroecology, uh, other areas uh, that we see can have really advantage uh, using these susceptibility results uh, globally. And finally, an interesting approach to understand uh, in a really different fashion what can happen with uh, the spread of diseases um, or in the case of invasive species, is the uh, process-oriented time-specific modeling, which allows us to uh, track uh, the dynamics of, of this dispersal of different uh, agents. No? And that can be really uh, interesting to explore or incorporate after what we, we saw in terms of recognizing susceptible species. I want to acknowledge uh, these four colleagues and all the other colleagues that have uh, made me think and work in terms of uh, epidemiology and uh, diseases. Angel Robles, Diego, Luis Escobar and Town have been key. Uh, in, 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 I haven't really worked much with Luis or, or Town regarding these topics, but they have been uh, you know, strong supporters in, in, my pa in the past, uh, uh, you know, and, and so right now, I'm, following some, some of what they have been doing uh, for many years. Uh, Pilar Rodriguez, again, thank you. And all the members of the Committee of the International Biography Society, 
and other colleagues and students that have uh, supported and uh, stimulated this research. Well, thank you. I hope this was not uh, like a difficult talk for you and, and at least the message was clear. Thanks. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Andres. Um, okay. So thank you so much for the interesting talk. We already have a couple of questions, but just before starting, a reminder how you can do that. Please use the question and answer um, box much better than the chat, because in that way we can answer, uh, we can actually track the, the questions. And if you wanna ask your question yourself, raise your hand and we will give you uh, the microphone. Okay, Andres, are you prepared? I am, I hope I am. Brilliant. Okay, so we have already two questions posted in the question and answer box. The first one is by Elizabeth Linares, and mm -hmm. she says, thank you for this seminar. It was an incredible analysis. Do you think it is necessary to include immune and molecular traits in susceptibility prediction modeling for... I think, I think it is. I think it is. And I think that's the next step. Okay. Uh, so that's something key, eh? in order to, to really, you know, disentangle which species are more relevant after what we did is to think about what really happens in terms of immunity and other processes. Uh, I didn't show that, that uh, last slide regarding that, but it's key. So yes, I, I, would, I would suggest that uh, should be part of your research. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Um, the second question is by Jorge Ari Noriega, and he says, hi, Andres, great talk. Thank you so much. If you compare the potential risk of future outbreaks between global climate change versus ecosystem or forest loss, which one of these two anthropic perturbations do you consider is more important to include in future models? So the variables, he was referring to the variables, right? Yeah, like, yeah, like climate change versus more forest lost or more ecosystem probably, yeah. I would, I would start with the land use change and then think about global climate change or climate change in general, yeah. So you think that the first in that order, variable would be I, more I, loss of forests and cities or closer to forest weather? I think that's, that's key right now and to understand what's happening and where, but again, we can understand that depending on the pathogen, the climate can be key. So mm -hmm. I guess the answer is, is not that easy, but I, I find it probably more relevant and depending on the question, actually. Yeah, those are two key factors. Your pathogen may be, uh, the drivers for that pathogen may be climate. And in that case, uh, yeah, climate change could be really important. Okay, thank you. So we have one question more, David Nogues. Uh, he says, Hola Andres, thanks for your talk. Can you explain oh. a bit more about those process-based temporal oriented models you showed in your last slide? How yeah. do they work? Yeah, so that's something we've been working with and actually Luis Osorio uh, Olvera is uh, the main researcher doing this uh, modeling and these are uh, uh, based on equations that are linked spatially to predict and are based on uh, demographic data. Although you can use different types of approaches, not necessarily with demography, but the idea is to predict uh, different jumps across the landscape. Now, uh, so depending on the dispersal uh, kernels of the species. Mm -hmm. And in that way, the species can explore the landscape, no, the territory, given the suitability. So the, the suitability that is used, or it's an output from niche modeling, it's a sur, it's a it's a is a landscape these species are, are moving through. And so uh, that's what we, we've been doing for parameterizing these models. It's when you have demographic data, it's really interesting because you can you know, predict abundance. And ideally, if you have uh, the fundamental niche and the centroid from the fundamental niche, if you have experiments from the lab where you have the response of the species to 
uh, temperature gradient, for example, you can uh, parameterize these models much better no? and track the species more accurately. So in essence, this is a spatial explicit and it's also time referred. Okay. Probably more questions will follow up with David. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so this is a comment more than a question. Juan Felipe Albarracin uh, said, thanks for the talk, very interesting. So, and then Marco Costello, he has two. First of all, it's just to um, check if the email is correct. So uh, just answer later. And then um, he has a question about um, warmer temperatures. Okay, so here is, I am curious about the mention that warmer temperatures inhibit some pathogens. Mm -hmm. Do you mean endotherms, warmer body temperatures help counter some pathogens as suggested for fungi in the literature? Or do you mean that ectotherms, vector, mosquitoes, tick, or transmission, or transmission in the environment? Well, I, I, I don't really get the question and it, I, it would be hard for me to answer that. Uh, I think it would be nice to, 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 to look at the systems and talk about it and to identify which variables are key. I think you are right in, in terms of trying to think about the, the variables that are relevant. Mm -hmm. It would be hard to, to classify endotherms, ectotherms as, as, you know, these two classes and that that would be. It may be the case that some endotherms, ectotherms behave like that. Uh, it would be something we need to look for or check. Uh, but in general, like we said before, some ectotherms may be more affected by temperature, for example, precipitation. Um, and in that case, Andres? Yeah? We can't hear you. Oh. I can hear him, OK. <laughs> okay. Oh, can well, you? you're back. You're back. Okay. It might be me. So it might, it might have happened only to me. So don't, don't worry. I just lost you. I'm not sure if you are there. So apologies. Well, in general, that was what I could think for that question. We could okay. talk about that. OK, we have another comment from Martha Gabriela Aguilar Flores. And she says, super interesante su participación, Dr. Lira, muchísimas felicidades. Gracias. Yeah. Mark Costello is just checking your email. So maybe mm -hmm. if andres.lira at inecol.mx, it's fine. That's, yes? that's fine, yeah. Okay, so we have that one, Mark. Yeah. And then Hannah Owens. Hi, Andres, right. really interesting stuff. Any ideas slash plans to incorporate complications when dealing with vector-borne diseases like malaria versus direct transmissions to two viruses? So far, not. Uh, this is what we did, no? I mean, we, we took them similarly and we're exploring this. Uh, but definitely it's interesting to think about other complications and, and in, in incorporating other, I don't know how to say, probably dimensions of for exploration, uh, parameters of an equation, or I don't, I don't really know how to do that or how to incorporate that. I know there can be complex modeling, but so far we stick to this idea of finding which can be susceptible species. And what we've been thinking so far regarding your question is to explore this more in, in, in the landscape scale. No? Okay. Look at this in detail with um, a case study where we can go and sample and see if this modeling allows us to have those predictions correct. Maybe that helps, but uh, you're right. Uh, there may be other factors that should be incorporated to have other more robust predictions. I wonder if that helped. Okay. Um, we still have a few minutes. If there is anybody else who could like to ask anything to Andres. Remember that you can actually raise your hand as well. If not, we are approaching the end of the seminar. Let's give just a few seconds, maybe. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, I see that everything is calm. So I'm assuming that we don't have more questions for Andres. And um, 
Okay, so thank you so much for the amazing talk and this new research that you're doing. Really exciting to see the results. And uh, for the others, thank you so much for attending. And remember that all the all these talks from the Fung lecture series can be found in the YouTube channel from the Biogeography Society. And remember as well that uh, to become a member, if you're not a member of the International Biogeography Society, we, we really uh, um, appreciate the attendance in here, but as well, you as well coming for conferences and enjoying biogeography in another level as well. So all the information for becoming a member is in all these links that we show in here. And I hope to see you in the next fun lecture that we will be announcing uh, very soon. So thank you so much. Thank Andres you very much, everybody. all of you. Thank you, Sandra, and thank you all. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Thank you, Andre. Thank you. Ciao,